Contemporary Feminist Analysis of Democratic Theory Building upon the foundations laid by earlier feminist theories discussed above, contemporary feminist approaches continue to evolve, responding to current events and developing debates. In what follows, we reconstruct three contemporary feminist theories of democracy, ecofeminism, social reproduction theory and care ethics, and queer and trans feminism. These modern feminist theories of democracy reflect ongoing efforts to address new challenges and expand the understanding of gender and other social categories like race, ethnicity, class, and disability within democratic systems. They highlight the importance of engaging with intersectionality, transnational perspectives, normative violence, environmentalism, technology, and vulnerability slash relationality in the pursuit of advancing feminist goals within democratic contexts. This section summarizes different Western and non-Western perspectives and offers a multifaceted analysis of recent contributions to feminist democratic theory. 1. Ecofeminism At the interface of feminism and environmentalism, ecofeminism highlights the conceptual, historical, and material correlations between the subjugation of women and the domination and continued degradation of nature. As a social movement and a form of multidirectional critical theory, ecofeminism challenges patriarchy and capitalism simultaneously. The synergies between environmentalism and feminism enhance both movements' conceptual and political aspirations. This encounter enriches each movement's analysis, adding depth, complexity, and clarity while contributing to the struggle for a more equitable and just society. Vandana Shiva is one of the leading exponents of ecofeminism. In her view, Earth democracy is central to understanding the relationship between democracy and ecological sustainability. Shiva argues that while we are rooted locally, we are at the same time connected to the world and the universe. Any global economy that acknowledges ecological limits must necessarily localize production to minimize waste and maximize human potentiality. This understanding highlights the importance of concepts such as sovereignty, citizenship, and participation in democratic theory. Shiva contends that democratic control over our food, water, and ecological survival is crucial to our freedom. For her, a living democracy provides a platform for reclaiming our most basic freedoms, defending our fundamental rights, and exercising our shared responsibilities toward protecting life on Earth, promoting justice, and maintaining peace. She highlights the limitations of current democratic regimes, controlled by multinational corporations, lobbyists, and coercive rules of globalization. This has eroded democratic principles, such that exclusion, hatred, and fear are weaponized to mobilize power and votes. In contrast, living democracy empowers us to engage democratically in all aspects of life and death by drawing on the intrinsic value of all species, peoples, and cultures. Shiva advocates for a more participatory paradigm of democracy that is lacking in contemporary representative democracies worldwide. Living democracy is simultaneously local and global, transcending the exclusivist logic of disjunctions and evolving through the non-duality and inseparability of relationships. This generates accountability and lays the foundation for sharing and having compassion, following the ideals of fair and equitable partaking of the Earth's vital resources. Through shared decision-making regarding the use of planetary resources, hitherto vulnerable collectives can become equal participants in transnational dialogues. To build living democracies, Shiva identifies several aspects, including reinventing citizenship and reclaiming community networks, expanding popular sovereignty, and reinventing global institutions and governance. She emphasizes that localization does not imply autarky, such that areas of life not amenable to self-organization require government. Shiva's theory also underscores the importance of accountability, representation, and the need to democratize national governments, international institutions, and large corporations, subjecting them to greater social control. This promotes a participatory conception of democracy, such that economies of care imply decentralization and participatory democracy and encompass cultural and biological diversity which precipitate participation and localization rooted in relationships and affinity. Another non-Eurocentric approach is provided by Jing Liu, who examines the relationship between Daoist ecofeminism and democracy, focusing on contemporary China. Liu analyzes how patriarchy operates in China as well as how it relates to the environment and suggests that Daoist ecofeminism could be a means to address both of these issues. 
Liu argues that while individualism and autonomy are important principles, they can become problematic when prioritized over relationality and contextuality. She stresses that the oppression of humans often takes place through the oppression of nature, such that the liberation of nature is naturally tied to the struggle for true democracy, both in Western and Eastern societies. Liu explains that Taoist democracy is a way of life characterized by equality and freedom for all beings, expressed through Xiren. Xiren is a Chinese term that means nature, self-going, being free, spontaneous, or natural. Taoist philosophy advocates that all things are equal and that human freedom can only be attained by belonging to nature. Ecofeminism thus provides a prescriptive account of progressive and liberatory interspecies politics and suggests concrete strategies to achieve it. Assailing liberal democracy for foregrounding political strategy and liberal consumerism, Val Plumwood highlights how a critical ecofeminist approach contests the architecture of liberal democracy that has resulted in the current ecological crisis. Ecofeminists challenge the capitalist and extractivist reduction of nature to private property, the appropriation of reproductive labor, and the coding of masculinist citizenship in terms of the disavowal of dependency as a human condition. The main flaw of liberal democracy is its failure to extend democratic principles to ecologically crucial areas of life, including the economy, paid work, and private areas, such as the household and personal life. Plumwood's insights have been further developed by many ecofeminists political theorists, including Catriona Sandilins, who connects struggles for social justice and extends membership slash citizenship to the more than human world. Tina Gabrielson and Caitlin Parody call for a radical rethinking of green citizenship and ecological democracy, drawing on Plumwood's work and arguing for a move towards recognizing the common materiality of humans and nature as embodied and embedded beings. Another important thinker in these debates is Donna J. Haraway, who, as a prominent feminist theorist, has notably contributed to science studies but also focuses on eco-political questions. Haraway's primary contention resides in the intersection of nature-slash-culture and sex-slash-gender, serving as the foundational premise for elucidating the valuable and pertinent contributions that feminism and gender studies can offer to the realm of environmentalism. Since the 1970s, numerous scholars within the environmentalist sphere have examined the notion of nature as a fluid construct that cannot be unequivocally deemed an unalterable fact or a reality devoid of entanglement with human discursive practices. Haraway criticizes the conceptual framework of modernity that perpetuates the subjugation of women and nature. According to Haraway, biology can be perceived as an extension of politics, as it has been instrumental in delineating the parameters of inclusion and membership within the collective identity of us. In her perspective, the natural sciences have provided the means to exert control over both the human body and indigenous communities by constructing the category of nature, thereby also enabling the imposition of constraints on human agency and freedom. Consequently, the appropriation and recontextualization of the concept of nature holds significant importance in social reclamation and emancipation. Haraway recognizes nature as a crucial cultural process for people who need and hope to live in a world less riddled by the dominations of race, colonialism, class, gender, and sexuality. Haraway, 1991, page 2. She criticizes the essentialist tendencies in ecofeminism by questioning the logic of identity. Instead of fixed essences, Haraway prefers to speak of articulated or articulations. Every entity is a set of articulations of diverse elements and never a homogeneous whole determined from within, nature being one example. This implies rejecting the premise that there is only one form, the real or true form of nature. Haraway rejects essentialist analytical ideas inherent in traditional modernity, prioritizing human and cultural dominance. Instead, she argues for a collective understanding of our existence, emphasizing the interconnectedness of human and non-human actors. This perspective acknowledges our existence within a web of relationships guided by a systemic logic transcending rigid identities. Biological and cultural determinisms are viewed as flawed assumptions, as they mistakenly attribute concrete existence and predetermined foundations to abstract and localized categories. Haraway's ecofeminism stands out for incorporating technology into the nature culture dynamic, which she terms nature cultures. It challenges binary thinking and acknowledges the interdependence of humans, machines, animals, nature, and culture.
Overall, ecofeminist perspectives highlight the need for a fundamental reimagining of democracy and citizenship that considers the interconnectedness of humans and nature and the importance of care work in sustaining both. Shifting the focus to ecofeminist European debates, we engage with two Spanish scholars. Alicia H. Pulio, who is widely regarded as one of the foremost ecofeminist academics, outlines the main tenets of ecofeminism that do not abandon enlightened universalism and its regulatory ideals. These tenets include, one, being critical thinkers, two, advocating for the equality and autonomy of women, three, accepting the benefits of science and technology with prudence, four, promoting the universalization of the values of the ethics of care toward humans and nature, five, engaging in intercultural dialogue, and six, affirming the unity and continuity of nature based on evolutionary knowledge and compassion. Pulio argues that an ideal democratic organization goes beyond the limits of representative democracy. She posits that the ecofeminist utopia supports a participatory democracy, which is not simply formal but deep and inclusive. Of particular interest is Pulio's reflection on the idea of fraternity. Although liberty, equality, and fraternity were the rallying cries of the French Revolution that opened the way to modern European democracy, the third element of this triad has received less attention from political philosophy than the first two, despite being an important normative principle in Rawlsian theory. Fraternity is linked to the moral sentiment that predisposes society to a fairer distribution of resources and recognition and is a fundamental normative principle. In the era of climate change, desertification, and biodiversity loss, fraternity must also include both sustainment to preserve the common living space as well as responsibility towards future generations. Fraternity is also important in addressing the conditions of those most vulnerable to pollution and the degradation of the earth, including women, children, and poor people of the global south. Pulio's ecofeminist approach to democracy thus emphasizes the need for deep, participatory democracy that goes beyond formal mechanisms of representation. Her reflection on fraternity as a normative principle, which includes sustainability, is particularly relevant in the context of the current ecological crisis. By highlighting the importance of caring for nature and the most vulnerable members of society, Pulio's ecofeminism contributes to a broader understanding of basic democratic concepts such as liberty, equality, and fraternity. Another prominent ecofeminist activist in Spain is Yeo Herrero, who advocates for economic rather than traditional democracy as a form of social organization. Herrero criticizes conventional economics for exclusively valuing money and formalizing the abstraction of homo economicus as an economic subject. In contrast to the reductionist my economy, ecofeminism centers on the we economy, which prioritizes satisfying collective needs. This requires seeking new forms of socialization and economic organization that foreground the maintenance of life over monetary profit. Herrero's ecofeminist perspective challenges the androcentric and biocidal logic of conventional economics, which fails to consider the needs of humans and nature alike. The relationship between ecofeminism and democracy emphasizes addressing collective concerns and inclusive participation in decision-making processes. Herrero proposes a radical change in the economy, politics, and culture, which would involve reorganizing the productive model and its impact on people. The we economy prioritizes the satisfaction of the collective needs of all individuals, which is a fundamental aspect of democratic theory. Ecofeminists, therefore, focus on what is essential for promoting a democratic society that values the well-being of all individuals as well as the environment. Furthermore, ecofeminism's focus on the intersectionality of oppressions and the interconnectedness of all living beings can provide valuable insights for creating a more inclusive and participatory democratic system. 2. Social Reproduction Theory and Care Ethics one of the most radical contributions by recent feminist scholarship has been the critical questioning of liberal understandings of subjectivity, which assumes individuals to be autonomous and sovereign. Feminist approaches to vulnerability and precarity highlight that humans inherently depend on others for survival. This approach contests androcentric and eurocentric framing of political agency and social relations. Feminists argue that being interdependent, vulnerable, and precarious does not preclude political agency or action. Marginalized groups, systematically deprived of life-sustaining conditions, often become political actors, claiming their right to participate in the public sphere and demand justice. 
This embodied and plural action is a response by vulnerable bodies who struggle for a more inclusive and equitable social order. The feminist focus on vulnerability is closely linked to the interdependence of care, which is vital for social reproduction and encompasses both the affective and material domains. During the third wave of feminism, Marxist and materialist feminist theories drew attention to the gendered dimension of domestic and reproductive work. More recently, care work has been re-examined from a global and transnational perspective, reflecting the current care crisis and its impact on women, resulting from economic, social, political, and demographic transformations. This crisis is intrinsically linked to several factors, including the dismantling of the traditional family, the increasing integration of middle-class women into the labor market, the concomitant disappearance of the housewife, and the neoliberal demand for labor flexibilization. These factors consolidate patriarchal structures in the care labor market. As a result, care has become a vital issue for the feminist agenda for the 21st century. The exclusion of care practices from the public sphere despite their crucial role in sustaining human life has been criticized by feminist scholars for decades. It is argued that creating a fairer society requires urgent recognition of care work's ethical and political significance. Since the 1990s and 2000s, Joan Tronto, Selma Seven Widgen, Eva Fader Kitte, and Virginia Held, among others, have argued that all members of a society have a collective obligation to ensure equal opportunities for giving and receiving care, thereby promoting an egalitarian society. Joan Tronto is particularly noteworthy for her significant contribution to the intersection of feminist care ethics and democratic theory. She offers a fresh perspective on fundamental concepts of democratic theory by foregrounding the intimate interconnection of caring, democracy, citizenship, and equality. This focus raises important questions regarding reimagining democracy and care work to foster the development of caring societies. Tronto argues that engaging with care ethics will lead to reevaluating the democratic concept of citizenship. As they disregard the relational aspect of inner subjectivity, mainstream accounts of self-interest and selflessness are inadequate in understanding what it means to be human. Society establishes complex social and political institutions to support altruistic and egoistical behaviors. It is essential to examine the structural and systemic conditions that enable specific forms of human action, including caring practices. The term quidadania, care and citizenship in Spanish, acknowledges the diverse array of care relationships and redefines the traditional notion of citizenship. By merging the terms pseudodania, citizenship, and cuidados, care, quidadania embodies a fresh model of social interaction that upholds the importance of interdependence without relegating it to a purely personal sphere. Thus, the mutual dependence of citizens on others to meet their care needs constitutes the basis of equality in a democratic society. In a nutshell, care ethics challenges and modifies the democratic concept of citizenship as it underscores how caring practices are essential to promoting equality and interdependence among citizens in a democratic society. A related approach is social reproduction theory, SRT, which emerged from socialist feminist and anti-racist movements in the aftermath of struggles for emancipation and recognition in the 1950s and 1960s in the USA and Western Europe. SRT is an analytical framework that examines how gender inequalities are reproduced and reinforced through social and economic structures, particularly concerning reproductive labor and care work. It is a comprehensive analysis of the processes of production and reproduction. Rather than just focusing on capital accumulation slash commodity production and reproduction of capital, SRT expands the concept of social production to include care and reproduction work, which women typically perform. It highlights how gender roles and inequalities are perpetuated through the organization of work, family, and society. While many Marxist analyses investigate the productive economy, SRT engages with issues such as childcare, healthcare, education, family life, and the roles of gender, race, and sexuality, all of which are central to understanding the relationship between economic exploitation and social oppression. Contributing to democratic theory, SRT provides a critical lens to examine key concepts such as equality by highlighting the often invisible and unpaid labor. Women primarily perform this work that is essential to the functioning of society. SRT also underscores the need for recognition and equality in both the public and private spheres. Alternatively, SRT brings attention to the constraints faced by those who perform care and reproduction work, often limiting their freedom to participate fully in other aspects of society, such as workers or citizens. 
Thus, care ethics and SRT compel us to question the conventional dichotomy between private and public life as well as their associated values and concepts. An ethical approach to care work changes political concepts and social policy. In contrast to the mainstream understanding of citizenship, typically defined by employment and viewed as a public good and a prerequisite for fulfilling human needs, membership is modified in a society governed by care. In a caring society, care work gains recognition, leading to a newer understanding of citizenship and political participation. Care ethics requires a reconceptualization of democracy, in which it is the collective responsibility of all citizens to ensure equality and possibility of giving and receiving care. 3. Queer and trans feminism. Gender is not an inherent or fixed characteristic but a social and performative construct. It is not determined by one's biological sex or by any essential qualities. Rather, it is a set of norms and expectations that society imposes on individuals based on their perceived sex. Therefore, gender is not a natural or fixed category but a historically contingent and socially constructed system of power relations. It is not a fixed or stable identity but a dynamic and contingent concept that varies across time, place, and culture. Gender is performed and reproduced through everyday actions, discourses, and institutions such as language, family, education, media, and politics, challenging traditional feminist and sociological understandings of gender by offering a materialist analysis that emphasizes the role of social and economic structures in constructing and perpetuating gender inequality, Christine Delphi's concept of gender is closely tied to her understanding of capitalism and its impact on women's lives. She argues that gender is not simply a product of individual identities or cultural norms but is fundamentally rooted in the material conditions of society, particularly in the relations of production and reproduction. She also criticizes the notion of gender as a binary system and argues that gender is not simply about the differences between men and women but about power relations. Gender, in her view, is a social division that allocates unequal resources, opportunities, and social roles based on one's perceived sex. Furthermore, Delphi challenges the concept of gender roles by highlighting that gender is not a set of fixed, innate characteristics or behaviors but is actively produced and reinforced through social practices and institutions. Gender, as Judith Butler explains, is constructed and performed through repetitive acts reinforcing societal institutions, language, and cultural practice at large. Gender is a complex interplay of social, cultural, and political forces and should be seen as a site of ongoing struggle and contestation. Butler's work encourages critical analysis of the social construction of gender and calls for greater recognition of individuals' experiences and the expressions of their gender identities. This approach to gender also challenges the traditional binary understanding of gender as exclusively male or female. There are multiple ways of being and expressing gender beyond male and female categories. This approach questions the assumption that gender identity must align with biological sex and advocates for a more inclusive understanding of gender that acknowledges and respects diverse identities and expressions. In recent scholarship, there has been increasing focus on the historical and cultural aspects of transgender identity and activism. In her work, Susan Stryker explores how transgender individuals have challenged and negotiated gender norms throughout history, examining how transgender experiences intersect with broader social, political, and cultural contexts. Gender, Stryker argues, is not related to sex in the same way that an apple is related to the reflection of a red fruit in the mirror, it is not a mimetic relationship. Perhaps sex is a category that, like citizenship, can be obtained by non-native residents of a particular place by following certain procedures, 2007, page 60. For Stryker, the genealogy of this relationship is established in a more complex way, both at the level of individual biography and socio-historical process, 2007, page 60. It is precisely through this shift of perspective and methodology that LGBTQI plus subjectivities, by denaturalizing the gender order, draw our attention to the processes through which normativity is produced. Transfeminism challenges and disrupts heteronormativity, which assumes that heterosexuality is the norm and that gender roles and expectations are based on binary male and female categories. Stryker argues that these rigid norms marginalize and oppress individuals whose experiences and identities fall outside these prescribed binary categories. Queer and trans feminist scholarship has enormously contributed to rethinking democratic theory by exposing its heteronormative bias. 
For instance, Butler's idea of gender performativity challenges identity politics. Queer politics undermines the logic of identity by rejecting the liberal approaches to sexuality and instead emphasizes queer desires in social interactions. Butler suggests that disidentification is crucial for democratic contestation, underscoring the importance of resisting regulatory norms that materialize sexual differences. Inspired by José Esteban Muñoz and Judith Butler, Hans Assenbaum proposes disidentification as a radical political practice with the potential to offer new interpretations of the democratic subject. For him, freedom as a democratic concept is altered through disidentification, which involves rejecting dominant cultural expectations of identity and finding alternative ways to express oneself. By disidentifying, individuals can gain more freedom to articulate their personae, which can democratize subjectivation and social relations. Although dominant discourses cannot be completely overturned, disidentification would allow individuals to work with the available terms and use them as raw material to represent disempowered subjects or positionality rendered unthinkable by the dominant culture. Isabel Laurie draws on the notion of presentist democracy guided by queer feminist protest movements. She challenges the idea that there can be a stable and transhistorical account of the right form and values for a democracy, arguing instead that democracy is a matter of political negotiation and debate that must be continually reevaluated. Laurie's examination of Rousseau's theory of democracy is particularly illuminating. While she acknowledges his masculinist biases and exclusionary implications, in his 1758 letter to French philosopher D'Alembert she nevertheless identifies him as a suitable mentor for a critique of political representation. In this letter, Rousseau pleads against constructing a theater in his hometown of Geneva, fearing it would lead to moral decay. He contrasts the theater's solemn and passive experience with the festival's vibrancy and gaiety, which does not require spokespeople or mediators. Lori uses this opposition as a starting point for reconstructing the foundations of democracy. Typically, democracies are understood as the rule of self-governing demos, however, in the shadow of the demos, the countless many remain dispersed, difficult to govern, and have always been seen as a threat. In Rousseau's dynamic and playful festival, Lori finds a model for a democracy that avoids the pitfalls of representation by favoring spontaneity and relative invisibility. Laurie argues in favor of a presentist democracy that does not represent the demos as a single people but instead sees it as a multifaceted multitude. This form of democracy liberates everyday local practices from the constraints of the private sphere, allowing them to become political. Such practices, which are not typically considered political within liberal frameworks due to their relational and dispersed nature, are no longer suppressed. However, multitudinous democracy cannot be achieved within a liberal framework, as its objective is to radically transform this very framework. This democratic approach challenges discrimination based on identitarian categories such as class, gender, sexuality, and race, while affirming the valorization of difference. Furthermore, it opposes patriarchal heteronormative and racialized gendering, which secures domination and reinforces existing power structures, and instead counters exploitative neoliberal relationships. The multifaceted emergence of the multitude provides new avenues for participation, organization, and institution building. Another crucial intervention by queer scholarship has challenged the normative understanding of bodies as autonomous and self-governing by proposing that all embodiment is fundamentally queer, constantly transgressing boundaries and embodying fluidity. For instance, Daniel D. Miller explores the traditional social as body metaphor and contests the normative understanding of embodiment. This metaphor legitimizes a hierarchical social order, with each member occupying and conforming to a predetermined place within the hierarchy. Institutions and regimes of a liberal democracy enforce this normative morphology of the social body by governing the people. Miller proposes an alternative vision of the social as body metaphor, where the people, or the demos, is a fluid body undergoing constant transformation, driven by the extension of liberty and equality to new social spheres. This vision undermines the representation of an organic totality and welcomes indeterminacy. However, it does not aim to dissolve embodiment but rather represents an expression of queer social embodiment. In contrast to neoliberal governmentality, queer democracy reconfigures the concept of the people by extending liberty and equality to new social domains. The demos in queer democracy are not limited to a privileged subset of society but include hitherto marginalized political subjects. 
It is constitutively incomplete, coextensive with the social, and marked by morphological fluidity. Thus, queer democracy represents a radical reimagining of the quintessential democratic concept of the demos, challenging normative understandings of the social body and its political implications. Providing a corrective to a Eurocentric approach, queer scholarship from the Global South rethinks sexual democracy and processes of decolonization. Critical studies, including decolonial and postcolonial theory, black feminist thought, critical race theory, and intersectionality studies, argue that the logic of the gender binary is no different from the biological essentialism of modernity. An imperialist approach differentiates between the humanity of white beings and the non-humanity or animality-slash-bestiality of non-whites. All other forms of differentiation stem from this initial distinction. In contrast, the African philosophy of Ubuntu offers an alternative framework for negotiating values and reimagining notions of freedom and justice. The Ubuntu philosophy posits that freedom is not achieved through personal autonomy or the disavowal of social obligations. Instead, subjectivity is attained relationally and collectively. As individuals express their unique singularity, they contribute to the unity and harmony of the collective and the cosmic whole. The collective, in turn, affirms their singularity by making room for and recognizing its expression. This focus on intersubjectivity challenges traditional Western notions of freedom and underscores the importance of interdependence and community while pursuing freedom and justice. Similarly, Rafael Bosques Garcia puts forth the concept of non-binary citizenship, a decolonial approach that aims to provide an open and democratic platform for those marginalized due to their sex gender sexuality identity. This approach opposes the binary mechanisms that have supported cis-hetero, male colonial Eurocentric thinking. While neoliberal governmentality is not concerned with constructing an extensive concept of citizenship, democracy aims to expand citizenship and make it all-inclusive. This involves recognizing the different dimensions of citizenship, including its civic, political, and social aspects. An inclusive construction of the status of rights holders, which includes civil, political, and social rights, is necessary to ensure that all individuals can enjoy the different aspects of citizenship as an indivisible set.